You, you, my guardian angel, take my soul of fire. <laughs> You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer. Esoteric Hollywood is where I deconstruct the deeper messages, symbols, and predictive programming subtexts that underlie modern film. In this show, we will be interviewing artists, experts, and numerous people in media fields. And this will all be based on my years of research in comparative religion, propaganda, psychological warfare, secret societies, and espionage. Esoteric Hollywood decodes the biggest movies in an unparalleled way, from the classics of the silver screen to today's blockbusters. Learn to watch film with completely new eyes as we enter Esoteric Hollywood. Welcome to Esoteric Hollywood tonight. You got it. The Shining. If you go to jaysanalysis.com, you'll see my mega massive Shining analysis that I just posted. Tonight we will be hitting the highlights and delving into this much discussed, much, analy much analyzed work of Stanley Kubrick. Probably the most famous director of all time, or at least one of the top two or three. And what can you say? So many pieces have been written about The Shining that, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where you feel like you have to do it, but at the same time, you're like, should I even do it? Because there's been so many attempts to decode and decipher The Shining. And just as a treat for you guys tonight, I will even do my Jack Nicholson impersonation for you. So... I'm going to start tonight's analysis of The Shining with a quote from a book that I read on Stanley Kubrick called Stanley Kubrick Director by Walter Taylor and Rookty. And they say, down the years had a phrase that he repeated like a personal mantra to hold at bay anyone who pressed him too closely about the meaning of his works or his intentions. Kubrick had a phrase. And it came from an essay by... H.P. Lovecraft, who was, like Stephen King, a popular manipulator of the occult. In all things that are mysterious, never explain, said Kubrick. The edict applies, of course, to Kubrick's own work, but even more so to himself. And generally, and generally, considered one of the most... Uh, probably the the best horror movie of all time. I think a lot of people take that position, and reasonably so. Kubrick's adaptation of the Stephen King story, The Shining, is it's in no way lacking of interpretive creativity uh, on the part of the people who do analyses and various film critics. We see things like Fortean psychoanalysis. We see esoteric speculation, generally about something a little more obvious, uh, and I think that the film's adaptation is intended to convey ultimately kind of the same message as King's, and that's demonic possession. Right? I think the story is about demonic possession. I don't think it's about a lot of the things that other people think that it's about <clears throat> who you know, really kind of stretch credulity. Uh, but I think we can tease out pretty clearly that it's a film about demonic possession and haunting. Now, it's not just that, right? So it's not merely the possession of Jack Torrance, <clears throat> but it's also the spectral hunting of America. And in terms of America's own dark past in relationship to the Native Americans. So we see, I believe, indigenous animistic spiritualism that undergirds the film, that manifests in a kind of generational curse upon Jack, as we will see. But not just Jack, it's also... A statement about America's elite. <clears throat> so as the film begins we see this camera vantage, this perspective that seems to fly in right from an aerial perspective. 
an aerial vantage. And it, we get the impression that it's almost like a spirit sort of hovering over the water, something like Genesis 1, like a spirit flying in. Uh, and I think we're going to see that this is something demonic, right? And we see reflected in the imagery there both the skyline and the skyline then in the water, which to me suggests as above, so below. And this mirror imaging really will convey the spiritual dimension of the film, the spiritual realm that much of, the, of what we see in the narrative is going to be conveying. <clears throat> now, as we see the camera hovering over it, it turns into Jack driving towards this ominous Overlook Hotel in Colorado, Colorado, built, we're told, in 1907, and is the site chosen for its seclusion and scenic beauty. However, there's a dark side to this locale. It seems to draw dark forces into its midst. While the hotel is, quote, real, we, in fact, discover that in Jack's mind, it begins to take on this otherworldly sort of portal aspect. Jack has, in fact, chosen this location purposely because of the writing of the story that is not a novel. But, in fact, his gruesome reenactment of a spiritual sacrifice that is required for his entrance into this mythic hall of fame, the abode of the beautiful people. The beautiful people, the beautiful people. The interview scene conveys this overtly Americana facade with Stuart Ullman, the hotel manager. And this clues the viewer, I believe, into a sort of dual symbology in the film. Where, as we said, the overlook is both Jack's degenerating psyche, the events that transpire there, as well as a microcosm of the history of the United States, all the way up until the period of modern imperialism. With a friendly, charming veneer, it's also the baby boomer generation with its dark side that is portrayed both figuratively and literally in Jack's brutality, as well as the mystic locale of the Overlook. So in a sense, America then is not just baseball and apple pie and manager Ullman's JFK-esque appearance, in fact, masks his own potential to be this nefarious character. While surrounded by icons of America, from flags to paintings of Native American artwork. And it is here that Jack divulges his desire for solitude and isolation to manager Ullman, suggesting, I think, this non-interventionist policies of the pre-New uh, Freedom Initiative America. It is also worth noting that, uh, in other words, the isolationism position of, of geopolitical political, uh, perspectives in the U.S. So uh, you'll notice as well throughout Ullman's office you start to see the same photos that will be so crucial to the film's conclusion. The black and white photos of the 1920s depression and boom, boom and depression era, right, which is the period in which the hotel had its heyday, we're told. In other words, that was America's heyday before the Depression, and then we have the introduction of, at least according to Woodrow Wilson and the New Freedom Initiative, uh, the expansionist foreign policy officially. Danny, we learn, uh, well, we should also mention that uh, Ullman tells Jack that the history <clears throat> of the caretakers involved a previous mass murder due to cabin fever, and this makes us think of the stories of Western expansionism and the cabin fever that people would experience, as well as the encounters with the uh, American Indians, Native Americans. The madness then ensues, and I think Kubrick on a geopolitical level is saying that this is what happens in the U.S. So Danny, we begin to learn, his the son of, of Jack, this young boy, has a special talent by which he can presage the future, which is the film's title, Shining. The ability to see and get premonitions and presage is known as shining. And the authors I com uh, quoted a minute ago, Walt Walker, Taylor, and Rukti, highlight this well when they say Carruthers, the character, or, or uh, Scatman Carruthers plays the character of Dick Halloran, uh, they say is a great casting success because his talent for shining springs from the animism associated with blacks uh, and Carruthers features 
themselves as face uh, give this ancient and weathered appearance like an Easter Island monument giving more gravitas to his character and while Cal uh, Dick Halloran will be the film's hero he is also a sacrificial hero now Jack explained to his wife Wendy played by Shelley Duvall that he explains that well, my wife's a confirmed ghost story and horror fanatic. I'm sure she'll be thrilled, right? That uh, <clears throat> that uh, she's not going to be afraid. Jack's telling Ullman about the uh, situation of being the caretakers of the Overlook Hotel for several months during this uh, blizzard because she likes the idea of horror stories. But what we find out is that when we see the Torrance apartment, Wendy actually shares an interest in the occult, not just horror and fiction. As we see the camera pan and uh, point out different vantages of the apartment, Wendy's bookshelf includes titles such as The Mother Goddess, The Magic Circle, as well as an image of her reading The Notorious Catcher in the Rye, purportedly to be on the person of many so-called assassins, such as Mark David Chapman. Now, because Jack has uh, unfortunately come to despise his nuclear family unit, uh, he believes that they are holding him back from greatness, right? So it's going to come into his mind, I believe, through the suggestion of the demonic to create a real horror to wipe out Wendy and Danny. Now, Danny experiences, as we said, a supernatural premonition and blackout at this point when Jack gets the job. And knowing then that they're destined to undergo this Overlook ordeal, we begin to suspect that Danny might even have been abused because Danny has this alternate persona, his name is Tony, right, that he talks to through his finger, uh, who lives in Danny's mouth and stomach, we're told. Interesting. In my opinion, I think the usage of the inverted stars on Danny's shirt in that scene in the bathroom when he's first talking to Tony is intentional because we later discover that Jack, in fact, is physically, and I will argue, sexually assaulting Dan Danny, resulting in his traumatic break and the introduction into his psyche of this secondary persona of Tony. And as well, if you read a lot of accounts of possession, you will find stories of spirits inhabiting certain areas and locales of the body. And it's precisely in this fashion. Now you're listening to Esoteric Hollywood and we're breaking down The Shining, this uh, phenomenal uh, adaptation of Stephen King's story by Stanley Kubrick, one of the most famous films of all time. And when we come back, we'll continue to under explore the dark side of this movie. And you're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm your host, Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. Welcome back to Esoteric Hollywood. We're deconstructing and decoding The Shining tonight, 1980 film by Stanley Kubrick. Now, we were talking about Danny and his experience of being traumatized, having psych a, a psychological break, the alter persona of Tony, who actually seems to take on his own characteristics, right? He seems to actually be another spirit and not merely something uh, that is Tony's, excuse me, is merely a fiction of Danny's imagination. He's not just an imaginary friend, right? He's not just a 
uh, a figment of Danny's imagination because Tony will actually have powers, right? He will begin to reveal to Danny things about the future, warnings, and so forth. And ultimately, Tony never does anything bad or evil. In fact, every instance of Tony is something positive and <clears throat> helpful to both Wendy and Tony and Danny. And we talked about how it, you will read these kinds of things if you read stories of uh, spiritualism and possession. <clears throat> now, there's a, a analyst out who's uh, written many good pieces by the name of Rob Ager. And uh, a lot of people have read his works across the Internet on both 2001, <clears throat> Eyes Wide Shut, and The Shining. And Ager's piece and treatment of The Shining is very good. It's very detailed. However, I will have uh, significant disagreements with Ager's work if you've happened to come across an online reading. Uh, but uh, Ager is correct when he says that the abuse that Danny has undergone appears to be actually generational. And this kind of shows the intergenerational conflict and Freudian sort of Oedipal envy, right? Because Jack ultimately resents Danny. That will occupy much of the story. Ager is correct in his insights as well. I think concerning this bizarre cartoon programming that uh, Danny has apparently received as Jack will become the big bad wolf. As probably everyone recalls from this film with Jack Nicholson axing the bathroom door down, screaming out, uh, I'll huff and puff and blow your house down. And this utilizes both Disney and nursery rhyme mantras, right, during all of his episodes of psychosis. And this is also, I think, why the cartoons are consistently displayed and seen throughout the film, because American living is kind of cartoonish, right? This country is very bizarre. It's very bound up now with something like Disneyland. Or as I say, we live in the Disneyland gulag. We also see numerous references to fairy tales, and of course fairy tales often ha times have a big bad monster or witch or something like of that nature at the end, Grimm's fairy tales. And so Hansel and Gretel, uh, classical works of mythology with Theseus and the labyrinth and the Minotaur will also be crucial, as we'll see. Hager is perceptive, I think, when he connects, for example, the old hag in the bathtub scene, right, to the classic notion of the seductive sea nymphs or the sirens that turn into hags or cause sailors to, for example, crash upon the rocks to meet their watery doom. And looking over the books visible in Wendy's living room, as we said, we saw actual treatises on what looked to be witchcraft. We see the magic circle, or is perhaps Jack the witch, right? That's also another possibility. We see a book called The Mother Goddess, and we see Catcher in the Rye. Now, it's impossible. It's possible that you know both of them might be in the occult, and perhaps uh, Jack takes it very seriously, and perhaps Wendy does not. Could be that that's why Jack wants to show Wendy what real evil is, because Wendy likes, we're told, ghost stories. Jack, if these books are his, might like actual evil. Uh, however, I think that could go either way. Now, the counselor is here in this scene, and as she inspects Danny after his episode, we... Uh, learn that Danny's dissociation seems to result from the physical abuse that happened when Danny's shoulder was dislocated through Jack's drunken rage. Wendy, though, it's important to know, is also partly to blame in this because she's willing to let the trauma go on uh, just simply because Jack gave his good word, promising not to do it again. Recall as well that the magic circle that appears in Kubrick's final film, Eyes Wide Shut, at the end scene in the toy store, in fact is also uh, arranged, apparently, in Danny's bedroom. If you look at the cartoon characters that are stickers upon his wall, you'll notice that they are a circle, and all the little characters are displayed in such a way. Uh, this is admittedly speculative, but the scene does show uh, conspicuously and intentionally the magic circle of cartoon characters. Now concerning the Minotaur, oh, I uh, cite again this, the uh, scholars that I mentioned before on film, uh, Walker, Taylor, and Rukti, 
And they bring out something fascinating that I had not known until I read this uh, book on Kubrick that they've written. Kubrick often positions Nicholas, uh, Nicholson visually against extremely formal backgrounds. That one frame uh, image has him in the abstract design of a wall tapestry, uh, a Native American motif, then resembles what looks to be almost a printed circuit. It calls to mind the rigor of programmed information. No de deviation is allowed. In another shot, Torrance looms above a model of the garden maze. The maze clearly alludes to the Minotaur myth in which a monster with the head of a bull and the body of a man who has been kept in a labyrinth and fed on human flesh until a hero, Theseus, kills it. It was a legend that had long appealed to Kubrick. In fact, the company that made Killer's Kiss 25 years before was called Minotaur Productions. In this film, the environment is destiny, not its instrument. As this dysfunctional family heads to their nightmare abode, Jack discusses the reality of cannibalism as a necessary-to-survive technique, and he sneers at Danny's awareness of what he saw on television, uh, that is, with Danny knowing what cannibalism is. Jack is here beginning to display more of his psychopathic and parasitic side in a premonition of what he will actually do with his own family to become cannibalistic, right? And it's crucial to note here as well that as Ager has, Ager has shown, Jack also has homosexual proclivities despite being a father. Touring the hotel, Ullman reveals that the secret to the uh, Overlook, right, is that it was formerly a getaway for elites, Hollywood stars, and royalty, whom he calls the best people. Kubrick's uh, dour view of uh, the American aristocracy of the 20th century is then, I think, reflected in the generations and in their offspring, represented primarily here by Jack as the baby boomer. The hotel is not merely a, a site for elite orgies and lascivious dalliances, but it's also a kind of sacrificial religious locale where the spirits feed parasitically on the fear of the victims and the blood sacrifice, much like we saw in Twin Peaks. If you've not seen my analysis of Twin Peaks, be sure to check that out because I go into great depth about what I think is going on there. Now, touring the hotel, Wendy refers to it too as a maze, right? And we know that the hotel also features this outdoor elaborate garden maze. And references here uh, are sprinkled about to cartoons and nursery rhymes yet again. And Danny, we see, is suddenly lost, right? He's looking for his parents who have toured the hotel and apparently forgotten him in the, quote, game room, as Jack rhetorically says when they find Danny. Well, did you get tired of bombing the universe, Danny? Right? Signifying Danny's representation of America as this aggressive imperial enlightenment experiment that sits upon a great Indian burial ground, right? It's the U.S., now, Kubrick, Kubrick was very much a critic of, uh, you know, Americanism and its foreign policy expansionism, as I said. And if you doubt that, well, all you have to do is look at Dr. Strangelove, right, where the absurdity of mutually assured Cold War destruction and the Rand Corporation, a.k.a. the Bland Corporation, are lampooned. Now, the Cold War great game of espionage, right, truly was a game room of the theater of war. Danny, we recall, had seen the twins first in the game room, and beside him is visible a poster, excuse me, beside the twins is visible a poster that reads Monarch. And given Danny's representation of both traumatized youth, uh, naive America, and even Monarch, right, can be applied to the nation as a whole, since, as many times I've argued in the past, the MK Ultra programs, the Monarch Mind Control, so-called, was really about mass social engineering. So more and more, we're seeing as we progress through the narrative of the film that Danny's abuse, trauma, and mind control is actually at the hand of his father, Jack. Now you're listening to Esoteric Hollywood, and I want to mention as well that that intro song was Dream Agent by Ariel Electron, 
Tiri Goti and Holig Spies. And that is uh, an excellent song that you can check out on the Corey Cosmu album. I'm Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. My book is Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. And you can pre-order that at Amazon right now. Welcome back to Esoteric Hollywood. I'm Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. And we're talking about The Shining and we just got through discussing the traumatization and the geopolitical aspects of the film. And as we're progressing, we you know, I mentioned the Cold War and the uh, lampooning of the uh, Rand Corporation, the Bland Corporation, right, and uh, Dr. Strangelove, Kubrick's uh, other sort of comedic satirical masterpiece and when we think about monarch right we saw this poster of the monarch uh, looks to be a skiing poster but curiously says monarch next to the gemini twins the murdered twins now monarch is reportedly an aspect of the mk ultra mind control projects of the cia that dealt with mass mind control and includes whispers of creating right dissociative states and altered consciousness through LSD, torture, traumatization, and so forth. And even if this has been exaggerated a bit, I think that the film uses this narrative unquestioningly, right? Because Danny is definitely subject to Jack's abuse, and then Danny's alter or spirit, Tony, right, is uh, clearly a dissociative state. And we have the game room reference to the monarch and the frequent use of the maze and labyrinth symbology that I think signifies compartments of the psyche. Then we note that Jack's exhaustion and sleep state in different scenes is accompanied with images of butterflies that signify this transformation that's happening with Jack, right, as he becomes more and more demonic and possessed. And we see this in the mirror. Mirrors often represent the subconscious, the psyche, the inner world that is reflected in our minds from the outer world. And it signifies also the spiritual realm, closely parallel to our own dimension, where much of the shining is in fact taking place. Now it's just this, <clears throat> this scene that Jack once again hints that he is writing the ghostly horror tale, and that it is not a book. He's going to write it into reality. Now, the maze is something that's crucial to the story, and this was a feature that was added by Kubrick to the to the original King novel. Uh, the, the maze is interesting for its symbology uh, in terms of being Jack's psyche, the traps and compartments, right, of the mind, as well as the, his writing of the fiction into reality, because the, the viewer begins to discover this principle of simulacrum, right, which is some images or, or objects or things that are uh, mimics or copies of, of things and then eventually sometimes copies themselves can become reality and this is modeled uh, in, and used in film at times to be sort of foreshadowing or to prep for what's to come now I've highlighted in many of my pieces the use of simulacrum in things like Close Encounters and E.T. by Spielberg, where the director will actually function as a kind of writer or magus or creator. And he will use these tools and toys, and oftentimes the Spielberg, they are toys, right, to prep for what's to come through symbolic objects like the, the toys in Close Encounters, in E.T., or even in A.I., Spielberg's later film. They show up as real objects right think of Roy's mashed potatoes 
and the television programs that are on in Roy's house in Close Encounters, played by Richard Dreyfus. We see the Ten Commandments where Moses is at Mount Sinai, and later the aliens appear at Devil's Mountain. And like Devil's Mountain in Close Encounters, the Overlook Hotel is situated on one of these high places, which comes out of biblical terminology where the spirits of the demons and gods and dead would meet with man to demand an exchange. Now, what I suspect is that if this is not merely a plot device or choice of nostalgic imagery, but in fact, it's an attempt to actually script reality by writing one's own twilight language. My thesis on twilight language is that it is a kind of sort of angelic script, right? That uh, integrates synchronicitous events like a kind of text to be read. And this is the older Hindi concept of what this notion is. And so writers and directors like King, Kubrick, Spielberg, right, are operating in that role of a kind of magus to produce a dramaturgical ritual that communicates ultimately with the subconscious. This is also why mazes and labyrinths have historically been associated with the underworld or the psyche, as we saw in the Lucas Henson uh, production of The Labyrinth, which I have an analysis of as well. Now, in the book Man and His Symbols, uh, which is a collection of Carl Jung and his followers' works, there is a piece called Process of an Individuation by a guy named M.L. von Franz, who was, uh, I believe, Jung's sort of right-hand man understudy guy. Now, in this piece, there's a great explanation of the meaning of the labyrinth in symbology. Von Franz writes... The maze of strange passages, chambers, and unlocked exits in the cellar recalls the old Egyptian representation of the underworld, and it's also a well-known symbol of the unconscious with its abilities. Simulacra, right, as I have written, is important to semiotics, the study of signs and symbols, because it plays an important role in esotericism. This is because of the idea of correspondences. And so before modern philosophy sort of divorced metaphysics from academia and philosophy. There was a more holistic view of the sciences in the Western tradition that included the idea of essentialism or ontology, the idea that things have essences, right? And that these essences are actually directly connected to the symbols that represent the object. Thus, there would have been an association between the symbol of the maze and the model, its referent, and then the actual maze. Now, this is a deep, difficult subject that gets into, you know, quite a bit of heavy philosophy. But the idea is really just lost on modernities because of bad philosophy. So Plato, for example, discusses uh, simulacra. And simulacrum even mentions, uh, where Spielberg's Jurassic Park even comes up at times, uh, the Michael Crichton story, in, in discussions of simulacrum, because the theme park, right, is a copy of reality. And a theme park is a good example of a simulacrum, right? Because it becomes real insofar as the theme park's real, but it's actually not a real place, right? Disneyland is a mythical, magical, fantastical kingdom. Or it's actually a mind control facility. Now, Hollywood, just like esotericism or like writing itself, is, in fact, the manipulation of copies, images, signs, and symbols, mimics. As I mentioned in my analyses, E.T. is all about, for example, symbols and language and meaning, just like Close Encounters. We're constantly given in these films camera angles, you know, for in E.T., for example, that show things from a perspective of a kid, a child's perspective. And so it's the same with Danny in The Shining. Many of the scenes will be from Danny's perspective. Now, reminiscent of the Hortus Palantius, right, is the maze of the Overlook Hotel. Hotel. Now, the Hortus Palantius was one of the eighth wonders of the world back in the uh, 17th century, 1700s or so. And this was the alchemical maze gardens of King Frederick the Palatine. And these, these vast gardens that he had built next to his castle. They were ultimately destroyed in the Thirty Years' War, but Palantine Elector Frederick was 
married to Elizabeth Stewart, and the gardens were built for her. Now, they were both, interestingly enough, buddies, BFF, with Francis Bacon of the alchemical and New Atlantis fame. And Bacon and many others, such as Descartes, were also sort of running in the same circles and seemed to have these kind of hermetic and uh, Rosicrucian uh, affinities. And that's partly why the gardens... I think, uh, share this alchemical notion and symbology because uh, one of the most famous Enlightenment scholars of this topic, a, a, a British, uh, the, the Dame Frances Yates, right, writ, writes in her book, Rosicrucian Enlightenment, about all this. And she talks about these uh, gardens for the first few pages of the book. Now, isn't it interesting, too, that when we see the pictures and images of the maze inside of uh, the uh, the overlook or at the overlook the maze very much resembles a kind of a mandala right uh, or a sigil now that's crucial right because i don't think this connection is tenuous and if you watch my or if you look at my analysis i go into some great depth about these different tribes who've been studied uh, by for example oxford anthropologists for the way that their artwork utilizes these different uh, mazes as sigils and mandalas. And I can't really describe this in an audio fashion. So if you're listening to this, you just go to Jay's analysis and you'll see my, my shining piece, or you can search for it. There is the, my esoteric analysis of the shining. And I think it'll convey in a fascinating way, the uh, principle behind how this works where you have kind of an imprinting in our world uh, of what is believed to be going on in the spiritual realm, and particularly with this tribe, the Malakulan, there is an after-death journey that the soul takes. And for them, the soul has to go through a kind of a maze, right? And this is where we'll find parallels with other ancient mythological stories that will tie ultimately into The Shining. Because this maze is not just... Um, kind of artistic design or uh, a magical talisman symbol. It's also an image of the psyche and of man himself. And that's what's going to be crucial to understanding labyrinths, mazes, and what's happening in The Shining. Now, constructed uh, in a similar way are some of the mazes of this tribe that, quite fascinatingly, come from tortoise shells. Yes, the patterns on the back of a tortoise shell, which are actual geometric formations in nature, for the Malakulan signified a maze. Now, the maze is apart from this diamond shaped. This is Esoteric Hollywood. We're talking about The Shining tonight, the 1980 horror film from Stanley Kubrick, rated by many as one of, if not the top, horror film. And I was just describing how, in the last segment, the turtle shell was a kind of signifier to the Malakulan tribe, the aboriginal tribe in Australia, of the pathway of the afterlife and how if you could actually trace with a geometric pattern with a single line the entire pattern on the back of the turtle shell you would get these 
sort of solutions to a maze. And it's a bit difficult to try to describe audibly. So if you would go to Jay's analysis and you can see my top post there is my really, really in-depth, exhaustive analysis of The Shining. And I take a different approach from many of the analyses that you can find out there. And uh, you'll see the images that I put up of the maze and how for this tribe as just a kind of an exemplar, right, which, which had these animistic beliefs that we find in The Shining, this pattern shows the solution to the maze and the afterlife for them. And so they had this kind of innate sense about geometry and that it seemed to arise from this ideal realm or the spiritual realm or the next realm or whatever terms we'd like to use. And I think it's applicable to The Shining given, given the animism that we find in this film as well. And the reason, as I said, the maze would be such a great allegory or symbol for this life is that our life is kind of a single trajectory, right, of wandering through decisions throughout life, this and that, right, right turn, left turn, what are we going to do, and will we make the right decisions and uh, arrive at a status of virtue and blessedness in uh, the, the afterlife, or will we choose our own destruction? Now, this scholar, John Layard, continues, as I quote, From the Near East to Malakula is a long way. However, there are connecting links that suggest the itinerary which the combined motives apparently followed. One such link could be found in India, where ritual and labyrinth designs are almost identical uh, with those made in Malakula are still in use. This field of study is only beginning to be investigated, uh, but as he says, the Sybil of classical and medieval lore may well be compared with the Malakulan devouring ghost who sits beside the cave guarding the labyrinth entrance. Through caves or clefts guarded by these mythical figures, mighty heroes of antiquity started their journey to the underworld to visit the shades of their ancestors. And particularly of note is the point that he makes from Virgil, right? Virgil's Aeneid. And he says Virgil's Aeneid describes just such a descent in the sixth book in which Aeneas goes to the underworld. Hitherto, scholars have very understandably failed to appreciate why, in his introduction to the book, the Latin poet interrupts his otherwise consecutive tale with a now apparently unintelligible interpolation concerning a labyrinth. Aeneas, who has finally landed at Cumia on Latin soil, approaches a cave and it's guarded by the Sibyl through which he wishes to descend to Hades. Here Virgil, often criticized for a passage that has nothing to do with the story, breaks off into an account to describe a representation of a Cretan labyrinth. Depicted at the entrance of the Cumian cave is right in its symbolic place because for the Roman reader the scene would have been charged with the emotional connection with initiation rites at the journey into the land of the dead. Now in this same book of the Aeneid uh, there's also described two waters and the outside flow of the Styx circles nine times around the river of death which Aeneas can only be ferried across uh, once he has shown the Sibyl the golden bough or the magic wand. And judging from the Malakulan evidence that we've been discussing, it, it, his own counterpart or spiritual double could be involved. Inside he comes to the river Letha, which are the waters of forgetfulness, which lead to the inner life, which for full initiation Aeneas must immerse himself to achieve new life on earth. So there must be a forget, forgetting of the old life as he returns to earthly life anew and initiated. Anew and initiated, excuse me. Now the esoteric and literary topoi or tropes or memes in connection to Jack Torrance then become obvious. Jack's own psyche then is plunging into the underworld maze of his dark persona where he's already under the reign of death. Why? 
because of his gradual possession. And I think this makes perfect sense of that infamous scene where Jack is staring at the model of the maze gardens that then morph into the real maze featuring Wendy and Danny in the center. You see, the underworld is Jack's psyche where, like the Minotaur in the mythology of Theseus and the Labyrinth, it's Danny who will battle this bullish beast in the center of the Labyrinth. Now this is why Jack, I think, seems to have a kind of bullish appearance at times, as well as a devilish minotaur look. Uh, and we actually see a minotaur in the hallway of the game room when Danny sees the omen of the murdered twins. Interestingly, the twins are Gemini in astrology. And we're told in the film that the time period is May, right? It will com commence until May 1st, which corresponds directly to the transition of the bull of Taurus to Gemini. The bull, Taurus, Jack, right? And then to the twins. And I think this is an intentional astrological correspondence. Now the omen of the murdered twins that sees Danny along with the vision of rivers of blood gushing from the elevator is also somewhat biblical in nature, which I think recalls the Book of Exodus and the rivers of blood curse upon Egypt. It's also possible that the twins that we see in The Shining have a twin tower significance, and since in something like Freemasonry, borrowing from the biblical text, the pillars of the Temple of Solomon, Jacob, and Boaz signify a doorway or portal to the realm of God, the spirits and angels, and so forth, because the temple was, of course, supposed to be an image of heaven on earth. Now, this is also the meaning of Gemini in Babylonian mythology, that Gemini is the gateway. And I think this makes sense given the title of Kubrick's other masterpiece, which we've decoded, 2001, A Space Odyssey, given the events of September 11th, 2001. What does Room 237 mean with the infamous room that we have heard so much about? and is in fact actually the subject of a documentary on Kubrick titled Room 237. Well, in my estimation, it doesn't relate to the moon directly. This is, I don't think about the moon. Uh, I do think that Wiener is correct in his work to point out the images of Danny in the Apollo shirt as a reference to NASA utilizing Kubrick and front screen projection filming. But I'm doubtful that the number change from King's novel is somehow about the distance of Earth to the Moon. Now, in my estimation, 237 is the location of the murdered, and the loca being the location of the murdered twins, right, room 237. This is supposed to foreshadow the coming murder of another child, Danny. Why? Well, Danny wears a number 42 shirt at the beginning of the film. And if you take 237, and multiply them together, you get 42. Now, if you're a bit skeptical, consider this. The film that Wendy and Danny are watching at about the middle of the movie, the film within the film, is a uh, 70s movie called Summer of 42. And in Summer of 42, it's a tale of illicit underage seduction, where a middle-aged woman seduces an underaged boy. And so it's a kind of a reverse Lolita-style tale of an older woman, right? And keep in mind, Kubrick directed Lolita. So I think we have clear, more clearer clues then that uh, the reference to Danny's 42 shirt and Room 237 connect to pedophilia and incest, right? Very much the same topic as the Playgirl magazine that Jack is seen reading at the beginning of the film, since that's on the cover of the Playboy. Now, other news reports uh, in the film foretell of this coming blizzard snowstorm, and we see Jack fall then deeper into trance states as demonic glares kind of become the norm for him as he, Wendy and Danny are beginning to feel the drag of cabin fever. Danny's shining kicks in, that is, the premonition and sixth sense powers, and he begins to see more terrifying images as Tony tells him that it's just like pictures in a book, it's not real. And so highlighting the surrealist dream state aspect of the film, 
Walker, Taylor, and Rookdy, the scholars I've cited before, point out, it was a perfectly closed set. And like Barry Lyndon, Kubrick was interested in helping his actors focus their psychic energy. They also point out that up to now, we might have conceivably believed that all of Jack's apparitions are only a part of his schizophrenia. However, once the storeroom bolts are physically drawn back by the unseen Butler Grady, ghostly Grady, Grady! That makes me think of Fred Sanford. Not that, not that Grady. Oh, Fred, Fred, come on now, Fred. Liberating Torrance to commence the assault, uh, when Grady frees him from the freezer, uh, the tables are turned upon us, right? It's, it's the ghosts that are not merely imaginary. They are real. And I think the psychic energy that Kubrick mentioned, that was a quote from Kubrick actually, that inhabits the Overlook and of particular note room 237, uh, we will see a sequence of scenes that I think are intentionally out of order and I'll explain that when we come back. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood and we're deconstructing Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. This is Esoteric Hollywood, and I'm about to huff and puff and blow your house down like Jack in The Shining. About to blow your mental house down, baby doll. We were just talking about the psychic energy that inhabits the Overlook, and particularly room 237, which is exceedingly nefarious there. And if you pay attention to the sequencing of those scenes around this section of the film, it's my contention that they are out of order on purpose. So when Danny discovers uh, that his dad actually is possessed, and I think that's why Danny really starts to freak out at this point, it's no longer Jack, right, who is merely the culprit. Rather, it's the hag who possesses Jack to do this, right, and in, in he's being taken over by these spirits that are inhabiting him. Jack, in fact, is becoming the portal and as I said before about Taurus in terms of astrology the bull the Minotaur Tor in old Gaelic or old English is actually about is actually a term that refers to a gate right a gateway Glastonbury Tor uh, and I have to give credit to Mark Hacker for pointing that out to me I think that ties in well with the esoteric analysis that we're giving this film right now now, Jack, as we said, is getting more and more progressively possessed, and this is the explanation, I think, of the scene where Jack investigates the bathroom and he sees the beautiful naked woman who becomes the hag, and this invokes the mythology, as we said before, of the sirens and the, and the uh, sea nymphs and so forth, who are ultimately illusory. They're drawing people into the subterfuge, <clears throat> drawing men in through the illusion of lust and beauty and so forth and then they become the hag right it's a trick and so the scenes are thus told sometimes from jack's vantage point and other scenes are from danny's spiritual vantage point through tony 
uh, where we're actually looking into the spiritual realm to see that it's not just Jack on a murderous spree, it's Jack and the spirits in his psyche, in his soul. Jack then is almost fully possessed by this point uh, and says to Wendy that at this point uh, we have to conclude that Danny did it to himself. And so Jack engages in a bit of gaslighting here for a willfully deluded Wendy who continues to fail to see the spiritual evil of Jack, sort of the naivety that we've seen from Wendy all along. And this is, I think, possibly due to her deluded view of spirits from her fascination with witchcraft. Now, while the notion of a mind-controlled monarch MK Ultra slave might seem outlandish, and I admit to being skeptical, you know, of how authentic that notion really is in real life, it is fascinating to see mainline Kubrick scholars deducing that that is what appears to be in this film's narrative. In the popular conspiracy vernacular, the reasoning, of course, goes that the CIA and various secret societies have raised certain persons to be traumatized victims of occult brainwashing, able then to be triggered at any moment with various codes. In my estimation, I think that it's definitely the case that generational bloodline family, families do traumatize their offspring and often do raise them in the occult with a kind of programming, I guess you could say. But as to whether there is a hidden cell structure of sleepers that are due to snap at any moment with some code to shoot up a theater like James Holmes, no. I think that was, in fact, a staged event. Uh, there are, however, elite satanic psychopaths, and they do prom promulgate psychopathy with their progeny. And regardless of you know one's opinion on those matters, what does seem to be happening in The Shining is that either Jack himself is traumatized and seeking then to traumatize and sacrifice his family for entrance into so-called greatness, uh, which he believes is being uh, stalled, right, due to his family duties, or it's about uh, the parasitic relationship of uh, that generation of the baby boomers upon their young now, previously mentioned mainstream Kubrick analysts will admit that the scene between Nicholson and Stone has a cool comic civility, and that this turns downright chilly as the spook gives Torrance his orders to kill his family, right? We're talking about Grady here. Uh, now, this is from the scholars that I mentioned before, that they play the masquerade with relish for its pinteresque undertones, and this is only hinted at by Grady's use of choice words like correction and it's as if there were, this were a trigger word for Torrance's programmed psychosis so interestingly there you have Walker and Rookty pointing out that uh, as just sort of mainline film analysts and scholars that this is does look like it's a uh, triggered mind control type of thing right now the horrifying scenes come to a climax with the family being uh, on the run, flying, fleeing throughout the hotel. And I'm reminded here of elements of storytelling that would later be used by directors, say Lynch or Linklater, where the surrealistic dream state blends seamlessly with the waking state to create this encote mystical formlessness to reality as merely an external projection of our inner psyche. Carl Jung, as well as many, say, in hermetic traditions, have propounded this view where ultimately the realization of man's own inner divinity is premised on a kind of awakening, right, akin to Far Eastern religious thought. Rob Ager's analysis, as we said before, was, ac was excellent in explicating various perspectives on dream states in the film from Danny's vantage point. However, I do have to disagree again with Ager's analysis that Kubrick is not interested in the esoteric or the occult. I also agree with, disagree with Ager that Jack's not possessed. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Big time. Danny's spirit. Doubt it. Right? And the occult references that we've shown previously, I think, show that we are dealing with a narrative that's supposed to convey a reality to the spiritual realm. But I will quote Ager quickly here. 
He says in his analysis, by far the biggest giveaway is Danny's description of his own psychic episodes. Halloran asks Danny how imaginary friend Tony tells him things, and Danny says, it's like I go to sleep and he shows me things, but when I wake up, I can't remember. Remember as well that Danny's very first psychic episode in the film resulted in him being found unconscious. Danny says, I remember my mommy saying, wake up, Danny. Much later in the film is heard in the bedroom the shouting, Red Rob, Red Rob, Red Rob, Red Rob. <laughs> His mother enters the room and shakes him right in the ensuing dialogue again hints at the nightmare nature of his visions wendy says wake up danny danny says well tony says danny can't wake up miss Dorrance. danny's gone away <laughs> <laughs> in this philosophy I think uh, mastering the inner world, right? This Eastern philosophy is supposed to lead to the mastering of the outer world. <laughs> uh, as the initiate or enlightened one meditates to achieve perceptive unity between the subconscious dream realm and the phenomena of the waking experience. And it's important as, as well, I think, to highlight uh, Freudian elements, right? Because there's obviously... An, in many Kubrick films, this uh, Freudian side. And as I said, our, our previous authors, authors point this out, and this ties back into the analysis of Eyes Wide Shut, which if you've heard my previous shows, you can find that in the archives at talknetwork.com or you can go to uh, YouTube or Jay's Analysis and you can find my audio and written analyses of Eyes Wide Shut. But the scholars pointed out, as we said, what is the meaning of this horrifying epiphany? Well, Freud said that film is like a waking dream. Kubrick also believed that his films connect subtly with the subconscious. Meaning, Kubrick said, can be found in the sensation of a thing and not in its explanation. However, Kubrick has provided a clue. In certain interviews around this time period, he mentions his admiration for a book, Rhapsody, a Dream Novel, by Arthur Schnitzler. Now, Schnitzler is also the author of Eyes Wide Shut. Well, not Eyes Wide Shut, but Traum Novella, which is the novella that's the basis for Eyes Wide Shut. And we do find that element in Eyes Wide Shut as well of uh, the dream state blending seamlessly with the waking state. Now, ultimately, I think the film concludes with what we call eternal recurrence, or uh, it's kind of the older uh, ancient Greek pagan tradition that the universe is just in this perpetual eternal cycle and everything will eventually return back to its beginning and start all over and this is where they would come to believe in the ancient world in the fates or destiny right now that is what we clearly saw in 2001 right and i think we're going to see it again here in the shining and we've also seen this in my analysis of lynch's film Lost Highway, where the end of the film culminates in a Baphomet-style pose of Jack amongst the so-called best people, the boom era of 1921 America, where the jet-set Hollywood stars and royalty are shown to be the ghostly parasitic inhabitants of the Overlook. And they demand that Jack offer up the blood of his family as his duty. You know, Jack's envy of the good life right as we said that he felt he deserved as a failed writer combined with the resentment of the family whom he blames also brings to mind to me Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment where the protagonist character Raskolnikov overhears a conversation about what it is to be a great man and in that discussion figures like Napoleon come up and it occurs to Raskolnikov that if he can murder his landlord and take her goodies then perhaps he can become a great man and isn't that what any of the other great men in history have done right just murdered loot, looted raped rampage pillage do what you want and if you're good enough you'll be the great man uh, but uh, you know is this really the way that we achieve greatness no
welcome back. We're, we're talking about The Shining and Stanley Kubrick and his adaptation from the Stephen King novel. And I was just talking about Dostoevsky's novel, Crime and Punishment, where Raskolnikov is a struggling academic, struggling student who's seeking to become great, to become a great man. And uh, not being successful, he, des he describes that, uh, his temptation to commit murder because he thinks that's the surefire pathway to greatness. This, of course, leads to uh, agonizing ordeal over many years and uh, life in a concentration camp for his crime of murder. And he's redeemed later by the character of Sophia. There is no Sophia for Jack. <laughs> Jack, in fact, will be a prisoner of his own uh, mental uh, madness, schizophrenia, and compact covenant with demons. Now, as I was saying, I wanted to quote Ager again, who is excellent on the subject of abuse in the film and traumatization and the generational connection to uh, things like incest and pedophilia. Ager points out the use of bear symbolism, and we see that one very creepy scene in the film where there's furries, right? This aberrant, weird sexual practice of dressing up as various costumed characters, uh, bears, and so forth. And he says the bear suit also has a bear bottom. Is this a pun? Is Kubrick using a sly visual metaphor to reveal us to us the certain characters in the film, such as Jack and Allman? as bear-faced liars. Being that the two bears in the film have the teeth and the one in the Colorado lounge which represents Jack the bear on the floor, the rug, uh, and then the uh, fellatio bear in the furry scene, already conclude that Wendy actually sees Jack giving the fellatio instead of Danny? Absolutely. And as it turns out, the abuse suffered by Danny is something that has been passed down through the generations. Abused children grow up to become abusers and repeat the sins of their parents in a continuous cycle. Jack's demonic bidders right, are offering him a place, he thinks, above amongst the privileged, the elite, if he's willing to rid himself of his family. This is why the issue of Playgirl contained the story of incest, as well as why the hotel has been the site of the lust masquerades, balls, and orgies of the sexual deviants. And I think we're reminded again of Eyes Wide Shut and that uh, wild scene which focused on the same notions of elite perversion, sex magic, secret societies, all at the uh, upstate mansion, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, in New York where Bill Harford finds much more is going on amongst the elite than he thinks because he's not actually at the top of the pyramid. Now although in uh, The Shining we actually don't see any overt secret societies, Ullman does seem to have a kind of familiarity with the young women who frequent the lodge who are possibly uh, prostitutes and loving the theme as we said of eternal recurrence and possibly reincarnation I would like to point out also my 2001 comments, if you heard the 2001 analysis, about Bowman and Starchild, right, of Eternal Return. God is an advanced AI in 2001, right, that we created apparently long ago, and then through our, uh, through its own self-advancing self-realization, something out of Hegel or Teilhard de Chardin, uh, it's created its own computer-generated world in 2001, and, then, and in that world are humans, and then, like, say, Neo from The Matrix, it's Bowman who breaks free of Plato's cave to cheat death and rise to rebirth amongst the gods and the stars. This process then repeats in an eternal return with a new Genesis narrative. Uh, if not, you can also say that Bowman simply evolves and it's aliens who are showing him the way to apotheosis. And in either perspective, it's a cyclical process of a time-bound emergent deity that arises from within the cosmos. And it's not an external, eternal deity who alone subsists outside of time and space and creates ex nihilo. And so in, re in relationship to Jack, it's Jack's experience that will be similar to Bill Harford's and Eyes Wide Shut. And while, of course, they're very different characters, they do have that same journey that they're on. Like the Indian burial ground, 
upon which the hotel is built, it becomes the site of ritual chant and ritual enactment, as Wendy's flight from Jack even features this creepy background music of Native American chanting. And this is very uh, parallel to the mass ball scene in Eyes Wide Shut with the Jocelyn Pook music in the background and the uh, reversed Romanian Orthodox chant. The sacrifice in the film is supposed to be the climax of this liturgy. And the release of the blood will then satiate the powers of darkness. Much like, as we said, the man from another place in Twin Peaks who requires the pain and anger uh, and sorrow from those who he's tormented before their sacrifice. And just like the mazes of M.C. Escher, uh, there's a sort of strange loop of eternal recurrence and eternal return. And this will be, in fact, the punishment that Jack concocts for himself in his own psychic prison for failing to complete the task that he was ordered to complete by the demonic spirits with whom he made a covenant. Frozen then like damned souls in Dante's Inferno, uh, which is an illusion. It's worth noting that Dante also made reference to the Minotaur in his uh, Cantato 12 of the Inferno. Dante wrote, My sage cried out, You think perhaps this is the Duke of Athens, Theseus, who in the world put you to death? Get away, you beast, Minotaur, for this does not come tutored by our, your sister he comes to view your punishment speaking of the minotaur there now in the shining what we see is a ghost story but it's also <clears throat> something much deeper in kubrick's film it's a multi-layered exploration of the psyche of the spiritual realm of surrealism of ancient mythology animism eternal return, philosophy, and a satanic occultic elite, geopolitics, and so forth that rules the West. Now, as the theme of pedophilic generational bloodlines parasitically manipulate the underclass through false promises of worldly prosperity, this is all emblematic in the film through the Overlook Hotel. For Jack, Danny, uh, for Jack, uh, Danny and the Overlook and its magnificent maze are a kind of America in a microcosm situated on old Indian burial grounds that has now become a world superpower intent on bombing the galaxy into submission and at the behest of the psychopathic madmen like Jack who are parallel in ways to the characters in Dr. Strangelove right with mutually assured destruction and the Bland Corporation it's this control control structure that operates through cult sex magic, the degeneration of uh, the masses through uh, pop culture, Hollywood, and mass media, the traumatization, inversion, and subversion. And this may, this is, well, if we think about, again, Kubrick, these are themes of films he's done, like Lolita, Eyes Wide Shut, and Full Metal Jacket. And it may, we, the ma maintenance of control over the masses then is through the real monarch program, which is mass media, social engineering. And we see this presented, I think, blatantly in A Clockwork Orange. So for Kubrick, The Shining is a, another in this long canon that displays, I think, the dark side of the spiritual phantasms that lie behind the mirror of our world. And I think a few points on Clockwork Orange could be made here. And uh, the Burgess novel, which is, is very good, is an in, there's an interesting take uh, that Kubrick presents as well. It's another installment in the Kubrick canon and ranks as a crucial film rife with social and psychological meanings. Now, I'm not going to go completely into this film. I mean, it obviously deserves its own in-depth analysis as well, but... In the film, if you recall, Alex DeLarge is in a dystopian future where society has de degenerated into this kind of trashy concrete hobble, right? Everywhere it's just a big bunch of Bauhaus, formal, uh, form over, uh, form follows function uh, architecture, right? Very disgusting. And it's just gangs ro roving, right? The droogs, the droogs run rampant, and it's Alex himself who is a gang leader. And the film will raise the question of the use of mass 
psychological warfare and control techniques from a sort of behaviorist psychological perspective, operant conditioning, as a means for creating a populace controlled by a scientific technocratic elite. Uh, Kubrick considered his film to be a piece of social satire that would question the notion of totalitarian, totalitarian regimes, brainwashing, and the public that are put into a kind of android state of existence. Now, if the subject could be conditioned, so it's reasoned, through mm, a kind of shock therapy, right, and then a loss of willpower and individuality, the the ensuing uh, status of the droog of the future, the future man, would be a controlled slave. He would lose all of his natural wild capabilities, right? Now, this is going to be important because it's going to show that throughout Kubrick's canon, there's consistent themes. And mind control was... You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood, and we've been breaking down The Shining, and I was pointing out some other Kubrick films that tie into this. Of course, we know about Eyes Wide Shut, and you can find extensive uh, analyses at Jay's Analysis on 2001 and Eyes Wide Shut, and also uh, The Shining. And I was also looking at the 1960, 1971 film, Clockwork Orange, which the reason why it relates to uh, The Shining is sort of this Nietzschean eternal return uh, will to power element as well as the uh, mind control element, right? So the, the mind control, as we were saying in Clockwork Orange, is directly parallel to the, arguably, the, aside from the spiritual element, the central theme of The Shining. Now, as we said, Kubrick thought it was also a piece of social satire, but really it's about man having his will uh, drilled out of him. And this is precisely what the figures at the Royal Society like Huxley, Bertrand Russell, Charles Galton Darwin, and many others, explicit, H.G. Wells, right, explicitly talked about doing as engineering a Fabian socialist uh, one world order technocratic slave state that we see in Brave New World with the world socialist dictators and the world socialist controllers uh, who would then create this dystopia and very well exemplified in the dystopian work Clockwork Orange. Now, my analysis differs, I think, from what you tend to see here as well. I think Kubrick presents another angle, which is that this Nietzschean elitist uh, class sort of structure that is totalitarian is in fact really the norm right as we think about that opening milk bar scene with the mannequins we see sexual imagery everywhere so a lot of freudianism in this film as well and it continues with this motif throughout combining sex with violence as the social norm so i think partly what kubrick is saying is that you know it's it's not just our day but uh, this is kind of society or civilization at its core, this is how it tends to be throughout history. And the film, if you think about Alex's parents, they're, they're, they're these completely docile, impotent, foolish, worthless people who have ab absolutely no idea of the actual state of world affairs, right? And strangely, Alex has an affinity for Beethoven. So it's actually Alex that kind of has some touch of taste despite his... Uh, unruly appetites now his predominant brutishness right as we said is tempered with a bit of uh, um, higher civility at times uh, which 
well, I take that back. I, I guess we could really, I guess we can only say that the civility or, or, uh, taste that, that Alex has is, is really only for Beethoven because in fact, you know, he's pretty much all about beating people and raping and it's Alex and his droogs that engage in the slang term that's been created what they call ultra violence or there's all these strange slang terms in this dystopian future. They end up raping the wife of this liberal activist, right, who opposes the state's draconian control measures. That's kind of a funny thing here about the sort of the idealistic leftist, right, who thinks uh, erroneously what human nature is, only to find himself beaten by the people that he <laughs> defends uh, as, uh, as being oppressed. The drugs, right? And so uh, Alex we see then also later tries to rape a wealthy woman who lives in this country estate and then he's caught by the police and so what we have is kind of a prophetic view of man's future dystopia this globalized 1984 style slum where there's a few elites and intelligentsia who live outside in the urban areas and then the cities are just kind of post-apocalyptic nightmares now the intelligentsia in this film, uh, like the writer and the behaviorist therapist, are seeking ultimately to cure Alex, who's a representative of the youth or the younger generation. And they have this faulty view of human nature, which I think is the key here. And the film is full, as we said, of sexual images that display, in fact, that most men are really led about by bodily desires, and they contribute more or less nothing to society. They're sort of like, uh, you know, Freudian, uh, uh, what's the anal phase of whatever psychoanalysis has, right? And so it's this therapy that's concocted by all the liberal activists and, and social theorists, right? That continually tries to make Alex into this productive member of society and seek to influence him with religion and other salves that ultimately are ineffective. However, there is a crucial point in the film, and that is that Alex does remain Alex. He begins a droog, and in fact ends a droog, right? And so much of the film becomes a powerful commentary on the unavoidable nature of classes and class structure, in my view. Now, I think that is what makes this a powerful commentary, right? And there will always be these classes there will always be well-bred and ill-bred men and so if we read Nietzsche for example he wrote about the master and slave morality and I think it's appropriate to bring in here and as, as I said this is all going to tie back into the shining as well so the misguided placement though of blame which the liberal writer in the film ends up uh, leading to his own uh, promoting it was what leads to his own demise right so as the people that he writes to defend and protect from what he views as the manipulative political class they are the ones who end up raping his wife and in short it's his unrealistic view of human nature and action which is the flaw of all liberals now my view i think is confirmed particularly at the end and as i said i we will do you know a more in-depth analysis of this film eventually just here touching on it as it relates back to the shining uh, is that you know alex ends up co-opted by this superstructure technocratic scientistic system and it's been that way all along right so Alex jumps out of a window he injures himself and becomes this martyr accidentally for the quote people the masses who at this point are starting to hate their upper governing class and so it's Alex who becomes this sort of dupe image this idiot face of a kind of dwelling bubbling lower class uh, resentment or spark of rebellion or revolution and so uh, what the uh, what they do then to try to to satiate this right is is they offer Alex a job within the system and he's pictured then with politicians and he's offered a reimbursement a big settlement and he dreams of everyone then watching him have sex in the snow. So it's, you know, Alex is pretty much just this thug and still wants to just get laid. He's not really caring about any of this because he's an idiot. <laughs> and he chides then that he was cured all right. <laughs> right. And in other words, having been run through this big massive 
cleansing, brainwashing uh, system, the, the washing machine of the of the system. Uh, he, he ultimately ends up this cog, right? And we think that, oh, this is finally what's going to cure the savage. He's not going to be a savage anymore. He's cured. Uh, but what we see is that all along, what he wanted was just to be a nihilistic savage. And so this final scene lets us know, right, ultimately that he hasn't been changed or cured. And he's just more adept at his mischief, actually. Right? So what society actually does is provide a pathway for nihilistic savages to become better at being nihilistic savages which were they actually just surviving perhaps maybe in the wild or in a more agrarian type setting or tribal setting they would not survive they would be killed off or die quickly due to their uh, nihilistic self-destructive ways but society actually provides a incubating bed for these kinds of persons and I think this is partly what Kubrick and Burgess in the novel is kind of trying to say. Now, what happens, we, we discover that this has uh, failed, and right, Alex remains what he is, a monster, and it's London that re recently has exploded into riots run by all these droogs, the revolution. Now, this was, of course, planned and co-opted by the system as Alex and his droogs were, because his former droog buddies are now cops. Uh, right, so the system actually hires as the police force the uh, idiot uh, psychopathic thugs. And it's the system that relies on the foolish utopianism of the masses to believe the lies that they're told. Particularly, particularly when it comes to things like science and the perfecting of man through scientific technique and social engineering to turn him into the new man of Marxist mythology or the ubermensch or the great man the this idealistic uh, fiction that cannot be created through the social uh, engineering process now ultimately at the tip top the psychopathic elite know this but they have beneath them a wellspring of dupes and fools who believe in the system and believe that the system actually can cure people and create the utopia and that's how the system functions in this cyclical scam pattern way right because you have a mass of people underneath the psychopathic top of the pyramid who believe all these lies about utopianism and that the system exists to further aid and comfort and perfect man and create these things that don't exist and what's the root of it all a misappropriation of what human nature is uh, not under a, a bad anthropology bad philosophy so it it's not any kind of human do-goodery right or fuel goodiness that will ever perfect man to make him into the state's archetype men are either well-born and well-bred or they're savage and no there's no mystical esoteric doctrine involved in this film presentation aside from the fact that the film's Images stress there at the top of the pyramid, which is the technocratic elite, the social engineers. And I think it means that the elite view is that they will, there will always be a caste system. And that's what we see in Brave New World. The Brave New World is a caste system under 10 socialist world controllers. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. I am Jay Dyer, and I want to tell you, be sure to check out j.talknetwork.com for all your organic supplement and food supplies.
final segment at Esoteric Hollywood, and we're talking about The Shining. And I was making a brief couple segment references there to the film in 1971, A Clockwork Orange. And in Clockwork Orange, what we saw was a brilliant display of the kind of brave new world, Bertrand Russell, socialist, technocratic, slave state nightmare, where the idea is that through social conditioning and operant engine, all these external applications and means that we can perfect man. That's the lie. That's the gospel of the establishment that it promotes, which of course is not true. Uh, under the guise of science and scientism, and in fact, it's all a lie where you can have a psychopathic elite at the top running it. Uh, now, as we said, no mystical doctrines in A Clockwork Orange. Rather, it's that royal society elite that is portrayed in the Brave New World system almost completely and totally, right, in this film. And Burgess's novel, too, of course. Now, I think that it means, as I said, that the elite view it to where that obviously there will always be a caste system because humans are different. Some are well-bred, some are ill-bred, and you're not going to breed that out of them. Uh, and that's the presentation of both storylines. Now, you can't change the nature of man, and there's no amount of blaming society, right, or ills of society and all these external factors for a problem that's man's internal issue. Uh, there will never be a curing of man in this world from his problems because man's problems aren't always or totally environmental. Man's problem is inner. It's his inside, his heart, his soul. And when you have a doctrine that teaches that there is no soul, psyche, there's no inner part of the man that is, uh, you know, created by God, there's just matter, then uh, that you can see why the philosophy leads directly to a scientific technocratic control state because the the idea there is that if man is just a collection of chemicals then he can be cured by the right application of external environmental processes this is animal farm this is brave new world this is clockwork orange this is 1984 <clears throat> now understanding that i think is ultimately the understanding of the nature of the system so to speak we talk a lot about the system the establishment and all this and that's the way to understand what it is right and as a friend of mine pointed out right an orange is a thing that's organic right and to try to treat it like it's a machine a clockwork is a failed enterprise and it's that mechanistic view of the world that we still live under from the enlightenment on right that has been dominated by these figures such as Locke, Barclay, Hume, Francis Bacon up into characters Newton and all these other members of the Royal Society that we've uh, expressed disdain for so many times uh, in this show and at Jay's analysis right the technocratic elite and uh, that's the root of the problem that's our, our uh, the final revolution that Huxley talked about in Brave New World. And, you know, Huxley laughingly says that the final revolution is not about egalitarianism. It's not about liberty, equality, and fraternity. Ha ha, you fell for it, you dupes. That's what Huxley says. Yet, the majority still believe the lie of utopianism and that uh, the revolutions and Marxism and communism and leftism and socialism and blah, 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 are ultimately about uh, the betterment of man and creating the new man and creating the new society, the great society, etc., etc. All those slogans and phrases are lies that are intended to make you into Alex, right? Well, Alex doesn't end up exactly what the system wanted because he's uh, ultimately still a nihilistic savage beast. Or his, the beastliness is never ultimately beaten out of Alex, but for most people, their beastly savageness is beaten out of them, and they become uh, docile uh, minions uh, of uh, the operant conditioning through the mass media, through education, and through the state. Now, uh, that's what's going on in Clockwork Orange, and the reason that that all applies to The Shining is that that's what The Shining is about in terms of mind control. Uh, it's Jack who is trying to 
mind control Danny and he's doing it partly uh, through his own uh, psychopathic sicko tendencies because he wants to be in the, in the club in the club of the beautiful people the the uh, the good people as Allman says all the best people and he's not a part of that club you know they have a, a lower class lower to middle class apartment that they live in he's a struggling writer and teacher uh, he, he's got uh, I guess writer's block uh, and so you know he just loses it right because he's not able to rise within the system according to what the system says is uh, social climbing right and so in Jack's mind when he freaks out and loses it he constructs this uh, offer this deal that's that's given to him deal with the devil so to speak that uh, the spirits say if you uh, will sacrifice the family right that's the thing that's holding you back you chose domestic living and that's what held you back from being great if you're willing to sacrifice your family as a blood sacrifice uh, we'll uh, we'll let you be uh, one of the best people right this is what Jack's after right? he, he expresses this when he gets angry and screams and yells at Wendy that you know it's you guys have held me back I would have been great don't you see I can be great I can be this great author I'm gonna write my uh, you know my, my masterpiece my magnum opus uh, if you would only get out of my way and it's you guys that have been the problem all along and particularly it's Danny and his special talents right he's jealous of Danny and so get rid of that family and I will be amongst the elite because all the great men in history uh, did whatever they wanted to right now this is a lie this is a trick of the devil and uh, that's what is the you know profound insight I think of the film The Shining of this storyline uh, you're not going to get what you want through human sacrifice and it's not just uh, ultimately this principle of uh, you know human sacrifice right it's 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 a principle that applies to any of us in life when we're tempted to think that oh I'm gonna get ahead by screwing everybody else over and that's what's gonna get me to the top and everybody at the top uh, screwed everybody else over to get there and that's how you get there no 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 uh, what you find is that that's actually the trick of the system itself to keep you out of being successful and flourishing right because once you start down that path of screwing everybody else over you'll by default no longer have self-respect for yourself because if you're not going to respect any other human eventually what's going to happen is because you're a human like them you're going to have disdain for yourself right even if initially you think that you know you're you're this great uh, super being this great ubermensch ultimately that comes back on you as well especially as you get older and you start to realize your own uh, frailty and finitude and so for the perpetuation of the uh, sins of the fathers right to the to the sons uh, is uh, kind of a cyclical trap and problem itself right and in the same way the perpetuation of narcissistic self-interest and screwing other people over is not ultimately going to get the promised treasure and status right status whoring and things like that that's not going to bring uh, what you think it's going to bring and that's what is so insightful in Kubrick's analyses is that he presents the system as putting out this uh, you know carrot with a stick uh, before the head of the donkey and uh, the 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 all what's offered right is not what you ultimately get uh, it's a lie it's a trick right and this is ultimately what uh, you know the biblical view has said all along you know you go back to uh, what's listed in scripture uh, you read the Proverbs you can read uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount and we see the same presentation there right where Jesus says things like you know what use is it to gain the whole world get all this junk and then you lose your soul right? you, you, you won't even be able to enjoy all this the stuff that you got right because you've forfeited uh, the very thing that would make it uh, pleasurable to begin with which is having your desires ordered rightly right so I think that's a that's a great message it's a that's a great philosophy to have 
And especially in an age when, you know, we live in such overt materialism, especially here at this holiday season, you know, all, all I see is just, just junk everywhere and just unbelievable consumerism, right? That the whole idea that this, that what we see is, is supposed to be based around some religious ceremony of Christmas is completely turned into this, the, the sickest thing imaginable of people fighting each other over, you know, Chinese slave goods. It's just unreal. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, I, I had to get some gifts for some people and I noticed, uh, you know, all these just people going crazy over all this uh, junk everywhere. And it made me think about how, you know, you've heard, you hear many times speak, people speaking about American Indians and how, ah, oh, you know, the Indians are so dumb. They sold their birthright for, you know, cheap beads and the, they, you know, they, they made these bad deals uh, where they gave away all their land and they got these like cheap old beads that they thought were really pretty and they were scammed and weren't the Indians stupid. And I got to thinking, uh, this fits in well with uh, Kubrick's theme in The Shining because uh you know those who kind of laugh and make fun of that kind of stuff actually it's our offspring and progeny and the people people today who are pretty much doing the same thing so just like the indians you know you're selling out your brother you're selling out your fellow man for cheap goods and crap right ultimately to perpetuate this system throughout all this consumerist nonsense uh, just like the Indians. So you're just as foolish. Black Friday, baby. This was Esoteric Hollywood, and we were deconstructing The Shining. Check out jaysanalysis.com and talknetwork.com. Thank you, guys.